Hi everyone, I'm Heaven. And there's no Tracy. What? 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 Your ears are not deceiving you. This is Heaven Nagatu on the mic, aka Young Oprah, aka Young Where the Fuck You Been? <laughs> Uh, I know you all think there's a rumor that I'm a ghost, that me and Tracy have never been in the same room at the same time, etc., etc. I insist I am real and I am here. I really, really enjoyed getting to pull a Kanye and be at my own concert by listening to guest hosts of my own show. It's so beautiful. I will never forget the way Bim said, hit him with the shoulders. And ever since, I have hit them with all the shoulders. So Tracy's out for a little bit working and writing and doing stuff, but I'm tapping back in just to say hi, guys. I miss you. Aw, y'all, I miss you. Don't get too cozy without me. So we're re-airing an interview we had with Hillary Rodham Clinton from October of 2015, if you can imagine such a year. Honestly, this interview has stuck with me, mostly because everything we've talked about keeps coming up and coming up what it's like to be a woman in politics. It's very clearly an election year where all the women of America, well, mm, not all of them. Some of the women of America are fed up. (laughs) I am one of them. Um, And it's just, I really wanted to reflect on the, the honest and vulnerable place that Secretary Clinton got to in this interview that I really appreciated. And the the unfazed nature of some of her responses, she's she's a she's a pro. <laughs> I love this episode also because Tracy uh, spends a good t- a good amount of time just reading her tweets to Obama, just some some requests, some thoughts, some questions, such as when is National Mozzarella Sticks Day? Hmm hmm. Thanks Obama. Where is it at? So Tracy's off doing some work and some things. And she will be back, and we'll be back together very soon. In the meantime, check out this interview. And Secretary Clinton, we will take you up on that bourbon offer, because when we conducted this interview, it was 2 p.m. in Iowa. (laughs) She had work to do. But, Madam Secretary, what's good? What is good? What's good, yo? For real, though. What about that bourbon? Hi everyone, I'm Heaven. I'm Tracy. And welcome to another round with Heaven and Tracy. Oh my god, it's really Heaven. Oh, I can't believe it. Tracy is a and big fan too. of me <laughs> and herself. It's everybody. We're excited, we're excited. <laughs> so today is a very special episode. Oh my gosh, I can't even believe that today is happening. We are in Davenport, Iowa. Listen, that's a place, first of all. <laughs> Who knew? We have seen three black people. Yep, yep. <laughs> Two of them were at the airport. <laughs> the other one works in the building that we're in. <laughs> yes. Why are we in Davenport, Iowa, Evan? We are interviewing one of the presidential candidates that you can see this week in the debates. Ooh, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? <laughs> I love that you're my studio audience. <laughs> <laughs> we are interviewing Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and I'm excited about it. I it's believe. gonna be dope. Before we interview um, Madam Secretary, I want to read a bunch of things that I expect from the next president. So these are tweets oh, that I have actually You sent. guys know about Tracy's tweet situation. It's an archive of Tracy's brain. So these are tweets that I've actually sent to the current sitting president. <laughs> oh, of course you have. <laughs> of things that I would like to see before he leaves office. What are a few of these, Tracy? I'm scared to ask. Okay, don't be scared. These are all very logical things that should be expected of anyone who is the leader of the free world. They're all very doable. Okay, before you leave office, can you institute some harsh penalties on people who leave backpacks on on crowded trains? Oh my God. Listen, we need that. Obama, we need this. Dude, what, you, what, what? Have you never been on a train before? How can you let this stand? What? How could yeah, you? Yeah, people act like they don't know how to hold backpacks. Right. <laughs> Put it on the floor. Yes, it does not need to be all up in my Face. Right. Um, also, please ban any feminism that is not intersectional. Thanks in advance. Oh, uh, that's dope. Yeah, right? that's just See? A, that's a great logical. One. Yeah. I'm saying. I'm saying. So you've tweeted all of this at Obama already. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. If I could have Obama grant me one wish, I think this is what it would be. Can you make the McRib available all year long? Oh my God. Why not? It's so that good. Is the worst idea. <gasps> <laughs> it's not though. Talk to me about the McRib. Why would anyone need that more than how much it is available? Because it's delicious, and sometimes you just need some mystery meat. 
in some barbecue sauce. You know, I can't say that you do. I can't say that. Well, agree to disagree. Okay. Can we declare people who don't like cinnamon rolls a protected class? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hear me whoa, out. Whoa, hear me whoa, out. Hear me whoa, out. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I said on Twitter once that I don't enjoy cinnamon rolls, not because they don't taste good, but because cinnamon upsets my stomach. That's it's allowed. a biological allowed. reason. I got so many hate tweets from people that I thought was my friends. <laughs> I thought they was my friends and they don't even write with me no more. And I was like, I don't feel safe in this moment. Okay. So I feel like So you want to be a be... protected class? Absolutely. Like black people? Yes. Queer people? Absolutely. People who don't like cinnamon rolls? <laughs> We are a very small minority, and we are not safe on American soil. It is true. Americans do love themselves. They, love <laughs> they do love themselves with cinnamon rolls. They absolutely do. That's wild, Tracy. I just, I would just like to feel safe in the country where I pay taxes sometimes. Has Obama ever responded to any of these tweets? No. Not I wonder yet. why. Because <laughs> he's busy. Okay. Because he, he went gotten to law to school, it. and he's like, that's not a protected class. <laughs> okay, wait, I have one more. I have one more. Is there a particular bureau that I should complain to when I order curly fries, but most of them are just, like, barely curvy? Oh, my God. Do that we is, agree on this? Yo, number Damn. one, yes. Number one, okay. All right, so we we agree on something. That is so rude. It is. Like You, you know how I feel about curly, curly fries. fries. I, <laughs> curly fries are my favorite flavor of fries. <laughs> I realize they are a shape, but come on, they're also a flavor. <laughs> You can't just curl a fry and be right. like, it's a curly fry. It has to have a very specific And then when you, you order some curly fries and you get two that are actually curly and the rest is just, just like... That's just rude. It's a lie. It's false I didn't advertising. order straight fries. Right. I didn't realize I had so many strong feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> so these are things that I would like current president to do. And if not current president, then next president. And perhaps our guest today can help us out with some of these things. But I, I'm probably not going to bring them up. Because <laughs> who says those things out loud? <laughs> Me. Well, before we get started, we saved you some bourbon. We don't oh. know if you'll partake. Oh, but. I've got so much still to do. If it were, if, if this were the last event of my day, I uh -huh. would take you up on it. Okay, well, rain check <laughs> Next time. Okay, rain okay. check. And got since it. you won't drink it, I guess I'll have to. <laughs> <laughs> so we are here in Iowa with Hillary Clinton, AKA Val, the bartender. <laughs> uh, Madam Secretary, I know you're a very busy woman, so yes. let's just get started. In a speech in Oregon, in 2014, you talked a little bit about the level of relentless scrutiny that stalks people in public life that gives you a sense of being, quote, kind of dehumanized as part of the experience. I mean, you've been in political life for like decades now. How, and you've had to be on for so long. How in the world do you stay sane in that <laughs> environment? I it's, don't understand. It's not easy. Can I tell you, really, it's something that you have to be aware of and try to fill your day and certainly your life with people you care about, people that you want to spend time with, activities that are just fun. I, you know, even though my husband was governor of Arkansas for all those years, you know, I drove myself around. I went to work every day. I took my daughter to school or to ballet. I had a really just kind of run of the mill, ordinary life. And it wasn't until he became president that I really encountered that overwhelming sense of the bubble, the, the scrutiny. So I don't know that you ever get used to it, but you do sort of learn how to manage it so that you can get up every day and go about your life. Yeah, we talk a lot about self-care on our show, like just day-to-day -day things you Thank do to take you. care of yourself. <laughs> well, it's important. Like, what do you do for self-care? Right, when you mentioned activities, like yes. what <laughs> activities do you do? Uh, I really love yoga. I love long walks, I'll go on those any chance I get. My husband and I take our two dogs. We go walking around where we live in New York when we can. You know, just things that you feel like, oh my gosh, this is what it's meant to be. This is what I want to do. And uh, I try to fit that in as often as I can. There was a moment when you were on the campaign trail in 2008 famous moment and one of my favorite moments that I've ever seen from a politician which I have like maybe two or three That's favorite rare. political <laughs> moments I'm I don't not know a if political I person sentence. at all <laughs> no, I never said like, that maybe three but you were in New Hampshire and someone asked you like how do you get up and go out the door every day and you got very very emotional I did I know that there's been a lot of talk about what led up to that moment but how did you feel afterwards like when you got home that night were you like oh I shouldn't have done that did you feel like you were showing a sign of weakness or did you feel powerful and like normal 
How did you feel when it was over? That's a great question, and I don't know that anybody has ever asked that of me before. I did not know that's how I was going to feel. At the time, I was doing an event, and I was sitting in a like a cafe, a little restaurant, and people were asking me questions, and they were asking me about political issues, and then I was asked, you know, how do you get up and do this? Mm-hmm. And it was a combination for me of feeling like, Somebody's asked me a really personal question, and it's very hard out there. This is this is something that just demands your mental, emotional, physical stamina all the time. And I just felt like, you know, how do I get up every day and do this? Mm-hmm. Um, and when it was over, I, I just felt drained. I didn't feel anything other than that. I didn't realize it was going to be such a big deal, to be honest. And Mm. then it became this big deal. And I thought that was sort of interesting that it did become such a big deal because to me, those moments, sometimes like, like yesterday, I met one of the mothers from Sandy Hook and, you know, she had come to meet me. I didn't know she was going to be there. I didn't know anything at all until she just came up to me before I went out to the event. And I just, I could just feel myself getting really emotional about it and those moments happen you know like even like about two weeks ago I met this young man who's taking care of his mother with Alzheimer's and he said I need help and I said well tell me what do you need and he said I'm taking care of my mom she has Alzheimer's I can't afford a caregiver I can't quit my job because then we won't have any way to make ends meet so I take her to work with me every day so when something real pierces the sort of political screen that you all, you know, anyone in this arena you all know gets built up because you're getting incoming and you're getting lots of questions about all this stuff. It's a moment that induces this kind of emotional, personal reaction, which is what happened there. I was surprised that people, well, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, that people thought you were faking. People often say that you're like some sort of like robotic, like rehearsed person. Do you resent that like relatability is the kind of currency that politics works with instead of like the years, the decades of right. public service? <laughs> Your actual ability. Yes. Well, I think part of it is as a woman, you're really held to a totally different standard. And you're expected to be both strong and vulnerable at the same time. That's not easy to do. Mm-hmm. And so you just have to be who you are. Uh, to the best of your ability, but it is somewhat frustrating because I know a lot of women in politics who are on the front lines, or women in any profession, media, business, you name it. You know, we talk about this. We all feel like if you do it, you're criticized. If you don't do it, you're criticized. Damned and if you do, it's just if you don't. so hard to get people to realize that, you know, we're all different. We may all be women, but, you know, we all have our strengths. We have our weaknesses. We, you know, get up every morning and do the best we can. And eventually people either get you or they don't. And, you know, when I ran for the Senate back in uh, 99, you know, I was, you know, very much facing the same kinds of questions like, well, you know, what about this? What about that? Et cetera, et cetera. And, um, And I just got up every day and worked as hard as I could. Even in this last presidential campaign, as you point out, I mean, it's such a marathon and it's so hard. And uh, then, you know, when President Obama asked me to be Secretary of State, it was a different kind of platform. And because I wasn't in politics, people were really nice about me. <laughs> you know, they said all kinds of nice things, <laughs> which, you know, I appreciated. But then as soon as I said I was going to run for president again, you know, the Republicans and the, the pundits and all of that. So I've gotten kind of used to it, but it does still pose this conundrum. How is a woman supposed to behave? Well, how about the way she is? And then people should figure out her as opposed to her having to figure out everybody else. Yeah, we talk a lot about being a woman in the workplace. Yeah. Um, I was really interested in the story uh, Senator Gillibrand talked about last year. She said, um, I want to read the quote because it's a great quote. <laughs> she talked about some of the comments congressmen have made about her body and just the harassment she's experienced from other male senators. She talked about how she wanted to cry or disappear, but I didn't hear a word he said. I wasn't in a place where I could tell him to go fuck himself. 
are you in a place to tell your male colleagues to go fuck themselves? <laughs> and have you ever? Uh, yes, I have. Ooh, but well, going tell, me more, name tell me more. No, no, going <laughs> all, I mean, but I've encountered those kinds of situations over the years. And, you know, sometimes you just have to ignore what's happening because there's a larger issue you're trying to deal with. And sometimes you have to confront it, and it's almost a snap decision. I remember I was in a situation where I was delivering some apparently unpleasant news to a group of men about an issue. And <laughs> literally fun. <laughs> one of them reached over and grabbed my shirt <gasps> and said, you can't be telling us this. And I just said, oh. get your hands off of me. I've been around a lot, a lot longer, <laughs> and I've had a lot of uh, challenges. But what I have found is that the vast majority of them can be dealt with by, uh, come on, really, uh, pushing back, basically saying, you got to be kidding me, or did you just hear what you said? Not accelerating it, you know, making it even a, a bigger confrontation. But then sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Do you find that men are receptive to that sort of approach? <laughs> like, Hey man, come on, chill out. And then do they like apologize? I've never like, heard I'm a man so respond sorry. well to chill out. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't use that. I say, did you hear what you just yeah. said? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I've had some. I've had some luck with that over the years. Sometimes nothing helps. Ugh, You're just listen. up against somebody who has got his own uh, problems that he's trying to. Yeah, people kind of made a point about out. how she didn't name Senator Gillibrand didn't name any names, but I got the sense just from the stories that this is a very common thing on the Hill. Do you feel like? just women on the hill are telling each other about who to avoid and who always says the annoying things in the meeting or like whatever, you know? I feel like who that happens to get in on every elevator industry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, that does happen. I mean, there, there. when I got there, it was clear there were some people that were just troubling and they just, you, you just wanted to avoid them. You wanted to just leave them. And I don't know who uh, Kirsten's talking about, but uh, there were some people who crossed the line in the way they treated women. And and so you just, again, you either dealt with it or you ignored it. And that's pretty much what she says she did. So we want to transition a little to talk about Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. we talk, we've talked a lot about our, on our show about uh, just the recent barrage of stories about black people being killed by the police. I want to quote specifically from the encounter you had with Black Lives Matter activists a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You were saying, look, I don't believe you change hearts. I believe you change laws, you change allocation of resources. You change the way systems operate. You're not going to change every heart. You're not. I don't want to speak for them, but I don't know if anyone was suggesting like policy doesn't matter. I'm more curious generally to hear how you see racial change happening in America, especially as a as a white person who was radicalized by Martin Luther King. You talk a lot about how hearing him speak and then his assassination like was really deeply meaningful to your your young life. Yeah. Well, I had what I thought was a very honest, very open conversation with the activists that I uh, met with. I'm going to be meeting with some more. Uh, my staff is in constant contact with them. I so admire their passion and their intensity in reacting to what is a terrible, continuing systemic problem of race and justice in America. And there's no doubt in my mind that they have helped to galvanize opinion across the country and that they have given real energy to trying to get some changes quickly made as like the president's policing commission has recommended and others. Uh, but I was sounding a note of caution because again, having done this for a long time, I don't want anybody who has that level of intelligence and energy and commitment to get discouraged, to walk away from the hard work it takes in politics to make changes, uh, because we need them. We need their voices. We need their activism. And uh, I've seen myself a lot of change that has happened. And it matters. I mean, the Civil Rights Act mattered. The Voting Rights Act mattered. But what I think people have learned is that there is no way that progress continues if there's not constant pressure. 
And oh, absolutely. That, I mean, I, I guess I'm curious more generally, what do you think it would take for other white people to see the problems that we see? Oh, I think a lot do. I mean, let's, you know, let's some. not. Let's yeah. say some. Let's not, let's not, let's not you know, be. But, I mean, I think there's just, yeah. I think the frustration of that interaction was not that the policy wasn't right. We can talk about policy, but that like on a basic level, people feel like they're not being heard. Like Black Lives Matter is a pretty simple plea. Right, right. It you is, know? it is. But if it's going to be a movement and not just a plea, then it has to build on making changes that people either have to accept or they have to f embrace. And uh, in many ways, getting people to accept the changes that are necessary will require consistent pressure and leadership at all levels, in the community, all the way to the White House. And that then you have to keep making the case, as I have tried to make going back to, well, going back a long time, but in this campaign, going back to the first speech I gave at uh, Columbia University in New York, you've got to be willing to constantly say there are gross inequities and you can't act like they don't exist. And one of the biggest is the way that African-American, particularly men, but also women, but let's focus on men for a minute, um, are arrested more, charged more, tried more, convicted more, incarcerated more than white men who do the very same things. Now, that's just a fact. And that is a fact that you have to say over and over again, as I have done to a lot of audiences that are predominantly white, and say, put yourself in the position of either one of those young men or the mother or the father of one of those young men. How would you feel? And it's not a question that is easily answered by a lot of white people because they don't have that experience. And you got to force folks to kind of say to themselves, hey, if this is really happening, and I guess there is evidence to show it's happening, then maybe I'd better change my thinking about all of this. I mean, it's a very slow process, but we made progress. Now I think in some areas we're stalled. So we've got to you know, put some you know, energy behind pushing forward and getting more people to do what they should be doing anyway. Mm. I'm very glad that you mentioned um, the very deplorable state of the prison system right now. You were talking about how people of color are arrested at disproportionate amounts over white folks. And tying this back into the Black Lives Matter movement um, or the conversation that you had with the activists, that conversation felt very um, unfinished to me. And I was reading some interviews with the young woman you were talking to. I think her name is Danasia Yancey. I hope I'm saying this right. My reading of it, and again, I don't want to speak for her. My reading of it is that a lot of people feel like you and your husband, former President Bill Clinton, are implicit in the, the policies that were passed and some of the legislation that was passed in the 90s, um, the Tough on Crime initiatives, the three strikes rule. I feel like what they were looking for and what a lot of black people are looking for is for you and or your husband to shoulder some responsibility in the crisis that we're facing now. So my question to you is, do you ever look at the state of black America today? We can focus on the prison system for now. And regardless of what the intents were, like I know that the 90s were like, it was a different time, you know, times change, legislation changes, needs change. But regardless of your intent, do you ever look at the state of black America and say, wow, we really fucked this up for black people? Well, I'll tell you what I think, and my husband has spoken to this. He spoke about this at the NAACP just last summer. You always have to learn from what you do. I was interviewed by Al Sharpton the other day, and I've known him a long time because I represented New York. And he said, and I think it's good to be reminded of this, that in the 90s, and particularly when my husband became president, there was a great demand not just from America writ large, but from the black community to get tougher on crime. And Al Sharpton said this. He said, I was one of those people who was asking that we get tougher on crime and that we clean up our neighborhoods and we stop gangs from killing each other. And he said, I was you know, going around boarding up crack houses. And he said, so we can't go back and say that we didn't ask that a lot of this be done because we did. I think what's important is you take stock of what was done and you figure out what needs to change and what we have seen over the course of now, you know, a number of years is that 
too many low-level offenders, too many nonviolent offenders, ended up in prison. And that became a terrible strain and drain on the African-American community because too many, you know, again, predominantly, not exclusively men, uh, were ending up incarcerated. So I, I think, you know, what my husband said when he spoke to the NAACP was, look, you know, we've learned a lot and, you know, t- took responsibility for whatever the impact of the legislation, but also re- being reminded there were reasons why that legislation was passed and very strongly supported across communities of color and everybody else. In a democracy, you're supposed to be able to keep being a learning political system. And now we got to say to ourselves, as people are, hey, maybe there were some good intentions, but those intentions had unintended consequences, and we got to deal with those consequences. But it's not enough, in my opinion, as some on the Republican side are saying, well, you know, let's just change the sentencing and all that. I'm for all of that. But let's also provide more supports in the community. Let's also, you know, make sure that people who are diverted from the uh, criminal justice system have a real chance to get, you know, the services and support they need to build their lives. So this is now, I think, got to be a broader conversation than just, you know, change the sentencing and, and you know, move low-level offenders out of the, uh, the prisons because that has to be done, but that's not enough. Do you think that that answer is a good enough answer for the people of color who are right now in jail because of a very, very broken system? Look, most of the people who are in jail are there under state law, not federal law. The federal prisons are are a very small part of the equation here. So you have to change the federal prisons, which are going to. That's why President Obama went to visit a federal prison, Mm -hmm. because the president really only has direct authority over the federal prisons. We have to change what are the vast majority of decisions being made in local jails and state prisons in order to move this agenda forward. And the federal government can provide some incentives, uh, like you know, put more money into drug courts, put more money into you know, services for people so that you can then you know, move states in the right direction. But states control their prison system. So again, that, that's one of those you know, distinctions that needs to be made. We gotta change the policies at the federal level to serve as an example and hopefully to provide some you know, incentives and disincentives so more states also change their policies. You spend a little bit of time as a young person, well, a lot of time, <laughs> protesting against the injustices that you saw. And now you are aspiring to the highest office in the establishment. What do you think young activist Hillary would tell current Hillary? Or what advice would she have? There's a role for activism, and I am a huge proponent of activism. And then there is a role for trying to translate the goals of activism into results for people. So there is a continuum here. You know, when I worked for the Children's Defense Fund, you know, we were trying to change a lot of things about why kids ended up in, you know, prison systems and why kids with disabilities couldn't go to school. So we were active and we gathered our information and we made our case. And then we combined forces with a lot of other groups. And then we got the law changed. And you have to keep doing that over and over again. There so to is answer no a question, yeah. what would she say? Keep doing what you can to okay. try to realize the goals that I've always had my entire life. Only now I will be working uh, on them from, you know, a different position. We are going to transition into our fun segment. This is the fun okay. part. You're Called doing great. Pew, pew, pew. pew, pew. <laughs> this is our rapid fire question segment, which isn't actually rapid fire. So oh, feel good. free to, I mean, I'm sure that you've <laughs> But we are kind of crunched on like, time, so like, okay. it should so be a little rapid. Be a little more rapid. <laughs> yes. Right, right, right. Okay. First question. Squirrels are ruining this country. <laughs> They are chewing through power lines and causing power outages. They're getting drunk and just making a, a mess and These a mockery of America. These are all facts. These are all true stories. They're giving people the plague now, I think. That's Probably. not a fact. That's not a fact. There are squirrels with the plague. I'm, I'm going to push back. Anyway, what are you going to do about this national menace? Well, I'm certainly going to draw a lot of attention. And I think it's important that uh, I'm for gun control, but people, as far as I'm concerned, can do whatever they want to to get rid of the squirrels hey, that are right. through power lines and getting drunk and giving people the plague. 
Kanye West announced he's going to be running for president 2020. If he asked you to be VP, would you do it? Well, I have to say, I've told Kanye that I think that he might uh, want to... Name drop. <laughs> we, he might want to wait, because uh, I'll be running for re-election. I see, I see. You know, I might want to try to give him some additional experience. So he's got on all the other things he's done on his resume, he's got, you know, some kind of envoy role or something that he can point to. But I would not rule out anybody for vice president. So that's a strong maybe. I wouldn't rule out anybody. (laughs) Okay, okay. In fact, are you two over 35? Uh, Not yet. I've got two more years. We are actually children. (laughs) Yeah, so maybe by 2020 you would be. So I won't rule you out either. (laughs) Please, please Um, hit us up. uh, In preparation for this interview, I watched a lot of your interviews, and I noticed you never sweat, like physically. (laughs) We are the sweatiest humans on the planet. Like... (laughs) We, I've done like a little bit of press and I get so hot. I'm TV sweating lights, right now. I'm sitting Stage still. lights. Like, what is your deodorant situation? Well, first of all, you've only done a little bit. When you've done as much as but I like, have. like, what is your secret? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my secret is just you do it so often. You didn't see me 40 years ago when I did my first one. I don't mean right? like sweat because you're nervous. I just mean physically. Lights are hot. hot. It's lights hot. Are very, very I'm hot. genuinely curious what your deodorant is. <laughs> you know, I, well, you know, I just I just turned off the thermostat. No, I don't know. That's do you have a spray situation? Is that a liquid? <laughs> I'm fake. I'm I am not joking. I'm sweating right solid, now, guys. Solid block. I solid. Like solid. Okay. Yeah, solid block I got to work on the better. solids. Yeah. Right. Okay. This is an odd question that I lobbied for a lot <laughs> because it's one of my favorite questions to ask people. If you don't have an answer, that's fine. But I will be a little sad. Okay, Tracy. Um, Jesus. What's the weirdest thing about you? The weirdest thing about me is that I don't sweat. <laughs> Yes. Obviously. Best theory Obviously. for Hillary's a I robot. Said. Zero sweat. <laughs> See, you guys are the first to realize that I'm really not even a human being. <laughs> I, I was constructed in a garage in Palo Alto this a very long a time ago. Tell People think that, you know, <laughs> Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, they created They it. don't even know. Oh, no. I mean, a man whose name shall remain nameless created me <laughs> in his garage. Are there more of you? <laughs> now, I, you know, I thought he threw away the plans. At least mm. that's what he told me when he programmed me, that there would be no more. I've seen more people that kind of don't sweat and other things that make <laughs> me think maybe they are part of the new race that he has created, mm. the robot race. So there's but, a cyborg but army. But I don't, you know, you've got to cut that. You can't tell anybody this. I don't want anybody to know this. I mean, this, no this has been a secret this. until here we are in Davenport, <laughs> Iowa, and I'm just <laughs> spilling my, you know, electronic guts to you. And without any bourbon. This without amazing. any bourbon, yeah. <laughs> we must That's why I have to good. wait till the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts on reparations and how soon can I expect my check? Because I feel like it's time, <laughs> Madam Secretary. I have a running time. <laughs> what's good? I'll tell you what I think is we need to make many more investments in uh, everything from preschool education to affordable housing. That's my form of, you know, trying to give people the the chance to be empowered to make the most out of their own God-given potential. That's what I believe. So, so Tracy that Clayton's check. not getting the check <laughs> yes. is what I just heard. I don't think that either one of you will probably need it, but, you know, you never know. I'll try to get the system to change. You don't know my bank account. If you saw my summary right now. <laughs> We hear you are good. Uh, you're fans of the Good Wife. We are fans of the Good Wife. Huge fans of the yeah. Good Wife. Um, is it hard to watch a show that's like borrows so heavily from your life? You know, I don't see it that way. But maybe I'm just being a lawyer. Who, <laughs> yeah, a lawyer whose Attorney husband General is a husband successful. Publicly. Yeah, all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I like the acting, and I like the outrageous plotting, and I keep you know standing there hoping that something even more outrageous will happen because then I know it's not about me because I've got a pretty <laughs> you boring know life the when next it all comes season. right down to it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite character? Alicia, I mean, you know, she's yes. my favorite character. Word. Uh, we're getting in trouble because we just want to sit in to chat forever, but we're being told by our producer mommies that we have to wrap it up. <laughs> and you should always listen to your mommy. That's always. what I tell my daughter. Always, always, always. I can't believe that this happened. I can't believe that you sat down and like yeah, thanks so much for to being us. generous with your time. Thank you, guys. Good luck to you. Yeah, Thank please you. come back. How long, have you, how long have you been doing this? Six months. Is that all? Yeah. You are a great team. Oh you got, my a, gosh. got a good, a good We're rhythm going. A little. Yeah. We're trying. We're learning. <laughs> okay. Thanks it's so amazing. much, Madam Thank Secretary. You. Thank, you so much. Thank you so much. I can't believe we did that. <laughs> I can't either. I can't either. Let's buy some rounds and um, then go yes. eat tacos, maybe. Yes. Um, who are you buying around for, Tracy? I'm buying around for the entire cast of the Broadway play Hamilton. Ooh. 
Ooh. But it's so good. Did you get to I went see to, it? I went to go see it on Sunday. And like, I didn't listen to any of the music before I went to go see it. And honestly, I was really skeptical because I was just like, a, a hip hop musical about Alexander Hamilton of all people, like that's not gonna that's be interesting. That's a great reason to be skeptical. <laughs> right, but I love history and literally everybody in my life has been talking about it. So I'm yeah, like, all right, true. let me go check it out. Like the songs are really, really good. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington had bars. I didn't even know. <laughs> Things the literally no one's ever little, said. <laughs> I know. Amazing. And the crazy thing is that like when we were watching um Secretary Clinton earlier today, and she like had the uh she had the microphone in one hand and like the other hands doing like politician hands, which are kind of like rap hands. <laughs> I was like, you know what? I see I'll allow it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I see why this happened because politics really is sort of like a hip hop battle. Kind like, of. Like, I'm the best. Right. This is why you should listen to Roll and with for me, me. Get with the winning team, As ho. opposed to this grub <laughs> yes. over here. And let me break down why this person yes. ain't shit. Yeah. I get it. I really get it. Also, looping back to the good wife, Renee Elise Goberry, who played the black lawyer that Carrie, like, had a fling with. <laughs> it's not the only thing she did in The Good Wife, but <laughs> Carrie is super fine. So that's what I think of when I think of her character, because I'm jealous. Anyway, <laughs> um, she plays Angelica Schuyler. And, like, watching The Good Wife, I was like how can you like sing this way you know like it's after hearing how good she sings mm. it's just like you the whole time you was on the good wife how, why didn't you sing a song on the good <laughs> wife i don't know <laughs> I think my favorite moments were the freestyle battles between Thomas Jefferson, not freestyle, obviously, but the hip hop battles, the hippity hop battles between <laughs> Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton. So good. You know, so I, good. I hear you. I hear that it's great. But uh -huh. I just have no vision for this. <laughs> uh, because it's it's a completely weird thing, but it's really, really good. So cast the and Hamilton. Costs money. <laughs> and it costs a shit ton of money. Yeah, that's yes. why I haven't seen it yet. Right. Cast the Hamilton if you're listening. Come on the show. Maybe spot us a ticket or two. And let's, Please, there's let's talk. I, it's not in my budget. <laughs> <laughs> I can't see that show. Heaven, who are you buying around for? Uh, speaking of the Good Wife, you guys know I've talked about this show a lot, but I don't think I've bought a proper round for the Good Wife. Mm, that's such a good show. This is how I pitch it to people because I am like an evangelical <laughs> Good Wife <laughs> truth spreader. <laughs> <laughs> Great show with dope women. They're always like fly as fuck. The yes. the outfit game is on point. Every single one of them. Mm -hmm. People who like Big from Sex and the City, that's a draw. Mm. Carrie, who is Rory Gilmore's best boyfriend, I would argue, even though that's a very hotly debated thing. Eleanor is not feeling it. Uh, our producer is shaking her head. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously the the protagonist, Julianne Margulies, AKA Alicia Florick, is a boss ass bitch. I think it does like a good job of talking about like being a woman in politics, being a woman at work. There's a lot of race stuff in it. Obviously my favorite character is Kalinda Sharma. Yes. Archie Punjabi. So Archie Punjabi on The Good Wife is like the only character on TV besides maybe the Broad City Girls that I would identify as properly queer. Mm. Like they take great pain to like not particularly say what her sexuality is and she kind of dances around it but not in a way that's like I'm closeted just more like this is who I am. Mm -hmm. So like she's just a like an unreal character in the TV landscape. But she's dope just on all other accounts. Also, her leather and like boot game is Listen, on point. Always. Listen. <laughs> but I am very, very, very upset <laughs> that they have not let her go on to season six. Like her mm -hmm. story ended. And what is the deal behind there's that? There's all this gossip about her and Julianne Margulies like having beef. So they, they didn't even shoot the final scene they had together. And I normally don't care for this kind of beef, but I'm like, yo, what the fuck happened? Right. I really love Archie Punjabi, and for her to be shortchanged like this, it was like, it was really bad. I love The Good Wife, but I really, really did not care for the way her p character arc has developed like the last few seasons. That doesn't sound like an endorsement, but it is a very good show. It's guys. a really good show. Also, you know, it's I don't watch the, TV, so. Yeah, it's one of the only shows I watch as it's airing because they do take care to be topical. They are gonna have season seven is gonna have Hillary Clinton as a character, ah. <laughs> and like when the primaries are happening, they're gonna have the primaries on the show. Mm. So shout out to Archie Punjabi, I love you. Come on the show. Having a sweat. What? We did it. We did it. <laughs> oh my god! I really cannot believe this happened. We laid on the floor for like five minutes after 
the Hillary portion was done. Am I allowed to say Hillary right now? After the Madam Secretary portion was done. (laughs) Thanks to everybody in the world. Thank you to Ben Smith, our editor-in-chief. Thank you to Ruby Kramer and Catherine Miller, who are dynamic and amazing political reporters at BuzzFeed.com. Couldn't have done it without you. Thanks to Hillary's camp, we really could not have done it without you because you brought her to us quite literally. Shout out to the pod squad. Pod squad. Hey. This episode was produced by Eleanor Kagan and Jenna Weiss Berman. Who have been traveling through Iowa with us yes. and keeping us sane. <laughs> and also all up and down the West Coast. Guys, crazy life. Production support comes from Julia Farline and Meg Kramer, who we miss very, very dearly while we are in freaking Davenport, Iowa, which is a place I never thought that I would go. Thank you to Optimus Prime. <laughs> Shout out to the Tracy. Oh my gosh. What a day. What, what a, a day. day. What a life. What a day. What a life. Thank you to our in-house musicians, Jean Gray, who you can follow at Jean Greasy on Twitter, and to Don Will of the Almighty Tanya Morgan, which is a rap group. A lot of people think that Tanya Morgan is a lady singer. She's not. It's a rap group. You can follow him (laughs) online at Don Will. That's D-O-N-W-I-L-L. As always, you can find us on Twitter at Another Round, on Facebook at Another Round. You can find all our episodes at BuzzFeed.com slash Another Round. And if you have questions or need advice, you can email us at another round at BuzzFeed.com. You can find me on Twitter at Brokey McPoverty because I have zero dollars. <laughs> and you can find me on Twitter at Heaven Rants. Heaven like the place I was named after that I don't believe in. Rants like the only word people use to describe Kanye. I'm getting so good at my you tagline. Are, that is amazing. <laughs> Great. Oh, man. Thanks for rocking with us, guys. Call your mom. Eat some vegetables. Yes. Drink some water. Yeah, like a green vegetable. Don't eat a potato and like, oh, I'm being healthy. I ate a vegetable. <laughs> eat a that green what vegetable. You did? Yeah, that that's how I live my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, take your meds. Refill your meds. Don't wait until they're out, and then you just don't have anything. Story of my life. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and if you like our podcast, uh, rate us on iTunes. If you don't, just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> we want to hear from you. <laughs> One more here, it. Thanks, guys. See you next week. See ya. Um, have you ever seen Frisky Dingo? Did I ever buy a round for Frisky Dingo? This I don't show? Know what oh my god. The words you're saying are. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the tweet is can you please bring back Frisky Dingo before you leave office? Frisky Dingo is one of the <laughs> best shows in the world. It had like two seasons. It came on Adult Swim. It was about this super villain who was like this big muscly skeleton who didn't wear clothes. Okay. And he has like this failing criminal empire and like his workers are mad. Cause failing they don't... criminal yes! empire. And the workers are mad because they don't have like health benefits and shit. And he's just like, yeah, I'm really just trying to take over the world. Can you do your job? <laughs> it's just, it's such that a good job. Amazing.